Hey, I'm Rob Witcher, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to network defense in Domain 4 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the third of four videos for Domain 4. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. It is incredibly rare to come across a system nowadays that isn't connected to a network and to the largest hive of villainy and scum in the world, the internet. There is huge value in interconnecting our servers, laptops, mobile devices, smartwatches, light bulbs, coffee machines, cars, and nuclear reactors. There's also huge risk. In this mind map, we're going to talk through some of the major tools and techniques we can use to protect our networks. An important concept we use throughout security and definitely need to apply to protecting networks is defensive depth. We want multiple layers of controls such that if one control fails, our crown jewels, our valuable assets are not exposed. Defense in depth means that at each layer of defense, we need a combination of preventive, detective and corrective controls at a minimum. For example, instead of having just a firewall between the super sketchy internet and all of our systems, including those that are internet facing like web servers, mail servers, and FTP servers, we could implement some network segmentation and move the web, mail, and FTP servers into a dedicated network segment, a DMZ. And we could further implement a screened subnet architecture with the addition of a second firewall. And we could even make sure our second firewall is from a completely different firewall vendor. And moving beyond preventative controls, we could implement IDS systems to provide a detective capability, or even an IPS to provide both detective and corrective capabilities. There are lots of options for implementing defense in depth. And as usual, all of this cool, expensive technology needs to be balanced against the value of the assets you are protecting. Controls must be cost effective. Let's get into the details of these controls I just blitzed through. Network segmentation, also referred to as partitioning, is the idea that we break our networks into pieces, segments, partitions, and then we control the flow of traffic between these segments. We can create different segments and apply differing levels of controls to these segments. One segment could be our guest network that we just allow out to the internet and we have very little controls in place. Another segment could contain our backend high value databases and we have extensive controls in place to prevent and detect unauthorized access to the segment. Organizations often have clearly defined boundaries between their internal network and the public facing side of their network and then control the flow of traffic between those two segments, typically with a firewall, which we'll get into. A moment on my soapbox here though, you should never use the concept of an internal trusted network. You must always assume that baddies are inside your network. Thus, there is no trusted network. Zero trust. DMZ stands for Demilitarized Zones. DMZs are a network segment where we place our bastion hosts, our systems that are intentionally accessible by the public over the internet. Systems like web servers, mail servers, and FTP servers. We fully expect these publicly facing systems will be attacked. And if they are compromised and they are within a DMZ, then the attacker does not have a foothold within our internal network. We severely restrict any traffic that can come from the DMZ into the internal network. The DMZ network segment is essentially just connected out to the internet. Bastion hosts, as I just mentioned, are computers servers that are specifically configured to withstand attacks. Bastion hosts are typically a public facing server like a web server. A proxy is a server located between two devices. A proxy acts as an intermediary such that all traffic between the devices must pass through the proxy. This allows the proxy to read, filter, and control the communications and even hide the devices behind the proxy. NAT and PAT are examples of proxies. NAT, Network Address Translation, is a method of remapping, swapping an IP address to another by modifying the IP header of packets when they pass through a proxy. Typically remapping an internal unroutable private IP address to a publicly routable address 
when a packet passes from inside the network out onto the internet. And the proxy should remap any returning responses, changing the destination IP address on returning packets from the IP address of the proxy to some internal system's IP address. And PAT, port address translation, is exactly the same idea, except instead of changing the IP address, the port number is remapped. Okay, now onto one of the most fundamental tools in network security, firewalls. At the most basic level, the job of a firewall is to control the flow of traffic between network segments. For instance, controlling what traffic from out on the sketchy internet is allowed through to the internal network. Firewalls have evolved significantly over the years and become a lot smarter about how they inspect traffic and make decisions on what traffic to allow through. We'll start with the oldest and simplest types of firewalls, packet filtering firewalls. Packet filtering firewalls only inspect packet headers, looking at the sourced and destination IP addresses and ports against a set of rules typically defined in access control lists, ACLs. Packet filtering firewalls are not very smart, but they are extremely efficient and can make decisions very quickly, meaning they have very low latency. They don't slow down the traffic very much. Stateful packet filtering firewalls still only look at a packet's header, but they're a little more intelligent in that they maintain a state table, a little bit of memory that keeps a history of recent traffic through the firewall. Here's how the state table can be useful. When systems want to establish, say, a TCP connection, they must go through the TCP three-way handshake process of SYN, SYNAC, ACK. The stateful packet filtering firewall will record that these two systems have completed the handshake and established a connection. And then, if either system wants to send a packet to the other, the firewall will likely allow it because the firewall knows that they've established a connection. But if another system were to send a TCP packet out of the blue, the firewall is very likely to block it because it has no memory of this system establishing a connection in its state table. To simplify, if a packet filtering firewall sees a packet going out, it will probably allow the reply to come back in because it remembers the outgoing packet in its state table. Packet filtering firewalls and stateful packet filtering firewalls both operate at layer 3, the network layer. Circuit proxy firewalls operate at layer 5, the session layer. Circuit proxies, therefore, understand what is happening at the session layer and will allow a circuit, a session, to be established if it complies with predefined rules. And all the way at the top of the OSI model, we have application firewalls, which operate at layer 7, the application layer. This means that application firewalls can do deep packet inspection. They can inspect anything in the packet header and reassemble a series of packets to inspect the contents of the data that is being sent in the packets. For instance, application firewalls can scan a file being sent to look for viruses. Application firewalls are very intelligent and can make very sophisticated decisions. However, all of this intelligence comes at the cost of speed. They are the slowest type of firewall and cause the highest latency. Most modern firewalls offer the capabilities of all the firewall types we just discussed. They can make quick and simple decisions by just looking at a packet header and, if necessary, can apply much more thorough analysis by inspecting the contents of packets. So you get the benefits of speed and intelligence where you want it. Moving on from firewalls, we'll now talk about the major network monitoring tools we use, IDSs and IPS systems. And we'll start with some simple definitions. IDS, intrusion detection systems, are designed to inspect network traffic packets to detect potentially suspicious activity. And if an IDS detects something suspicious, it will raise an alarm. IPS, intrusion prevention systems, do exactly the same thing as an IDS, attempt to detect suspicious activity, but then go an important step further. If they detect something suspicious, they can potentially block the suspicious traffic hence preventing an attack from occurring. IDSs can work in combination with, say, a firewall to block traffic, but IPSs can detect and block traffic on their own. There are two major locations where we can put IDSs and IPSs. Host-based means the IDS or IPS is installed on a specific host, typically a high-value server, and the IDS or IPS is monitoring just the host that is installed on. If you want to monitor multiple hosts, then you'd need multiple host-based IDS or IPS systems, one on each host. A network-based IDS or IPS is connected to a network segment and monitors all the traffic within that network segment. 
There are a couple of ways that a network-based IDS or IPS can be connected to a network segment. One method is inline, which means that all the traffic coming in and out of the network segment must pass through the IDS or IPS. IPSs are often installed inline. And the advantage of inline is that if the IPS detects some traffic it doesn't like, it can easily block the traffic, as all the traffic must pass through the IPS. The major downside of inline is it is another point of failure. If the inline IDS or IPS system goes down or fails secure, then all traffic will be blocked, causing a denial of service. The other method of connecting an IDS or IPS to a network segment is to connect it to a switch and then configure the specific switch port that the IDS or IPS is connected to to be a mirror or span or my favorite name, a promiscuous port. By default, a switch will only forward packets to the intended system. Thus, by default, the IDS or IPS wouldn't see most of the traffic transiting the switch. Setting a port to mirror, span, or promiscuous means that all the packets going through the switch will be copied, will be mirrored to that port and sent to the IDS or IPS so that it can monitor everything. It is more common to install an IDS in this configuration. Now let's talk about the two major methods that IDSs or IPS systems can use to look for suspicious activity. Pattern matching means the IDS or IPS has been programmed to look for a specific pattern, for example, a specific type of network attack, and will alert or block if that pattern is detected. The advantage of pattern matching systems is they can be fast and efficient, but the downside is they can only detect what they have been programmed to detect. The way a pattern matching IDS or IPS system is told to look for a specific pattern is often referred to as signature analysis. You can think of a signature as a unique fingerprint for a specific type of network attack. Therefore, the IDS or IPS system can have specific patterns or signatures programmed into it to look for things like a certain bike code sequence in a network traffic or known malicious intrusion sequence steps. Anomaly-based detection is a different approach that doesn't rely on signatures and is meant to address the weakness that pattern matching systems can only detect what they have been programmed to detect. With anomaly-based detection, the IDS or IPS learns what normal looks like. It establishes a baseline, and then the system can look for behaviors that fall outside the accepted model of behavior, behaviors that are anomalous. There are four major ways anomalies can be detected. Stateful matching means the IDS or IPS looks for anomalies in the context of a stream of traffic. The IDS or IPS maintains a state table and can, for instance, detect if a system starts sending TCP packets to another system that it hasn't established a session with. In statistical anomaly-based detection, the IDS or IPS compares traffic to typical, known, or predicted traffic profiles to look for statistically significant anomalies from the norm. Protocol anomaly-based detection is where anomalies can be detected based on network protocols being used. For instance, certain protocols can be defined as allowed, and all other protocols will be an anomaly. An organization might only allow S FTP, and if any FTP or especially T FTP traffic is detected, that is an anomaly. And finally, Traffic identifies anomalies in expected pattern and behavior of network traffic transmitted within a session. IDSs and IPS systems can use whitelists or blacklists as a means of detecting suspicious activity. A much better name for whitelist is an allow list. It is a list of IPs that a system is allowed to connect to and all other IPs are blocked. And a much better name for blacklist is a deny list. It is a list of IPs that the system is not allowed to connect to. Access is denied, and all their IP addresses are allowed. An IDS or IPS can be programmed to inspect traffic based on these allow or deny lists. The final method that I'll discuss that IDSs or IPSs can use to detect suspicious traffic is sandboxes. Sandboxes provide a safe area to run untrusted code and then observe what the code is doing attempting to install ransomware, perhaps. An IDS or IPS system could detect that an executable file is being transmitted. The IDS or IPS could then take a copy of the executable and run it in a sandbox to see what it does. And if something nefarious is detected, then the IDS or IPS can alert and potentially even block the file from being sent to the intended victim system. A really cool way to detect an attacker on a network is to use honeypots or 
honey nets. A honey pot is a system that looks as close as possible to a real system, like a file server or a print server or a database or an industrial control system. However, the honeypot is not a real system that is meant to be used by employees or clients in the organization. Rather, the honeypot is carefully monitored, and if someone is trying to connect to it and use the honeypot, that is a very good indicator that you may have a threat actor in your environment that is exploring and looking for systems to compromise. A honeypot is a single system, and a honey net is a whole network of honeypots. Honeypots and honey nets are a good way of detecting advanced persistent threats. And the final inspection method that I'll talk about is ingress and egress monitoring. Monitoring the traffic that is coming into a network, ingress, from say the internet, or the traffic that is leaving a network, egress. It is not uncommon for organizations to detect that they've had a breach by watching the traffic that is leaving, egressing their network. If traffic is going out to a known bad IP address, that's a good indication that some malware has somehow infected a company system and the malware is calling home. ET found home. You can never have a secure network if the endpoints, the laptops, mobile phones, iPads, Alexa devices, IP security cameras, etc., are not secure. As I discussed in the fourth video of Domain 3, it is critical to secure to harden endpoint devices by ensuring they're correctly configured, patched, have strong authentication, and so forth. And that is an overview of network defense within Domain 4, covering the most critical concepts to know for the exam. If you found this video helpful, you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this mind map series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. I will provide links to the other mind map videos in the description below. Thanks very much for watching, and all the best in your studies.